Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and the time has finally come. We are going to talk about contrast paints. So uh, this is the our guide to contrast paints. Uh, there's going to be multiple sections to this. We're going to try to make this the ultimate guide where we cover kind of all the different ways you can use them, the properties of them, how they work, how you can integrate them into various techniques and get the most out of them. So. We're going to start here at the beginning with the basics. The additional sections are all going to be time stamped down below. So you can go check in the description if you want to see the other elements. The other things we're going to be covering today in this video uh, beyond the basics here, uh, we're going to cover mixing them, mixing them together to get different effects. We're going to cover various types of blending. Uh, by the way, with mixing, we're going to talk about also mixing them into other types of paints. Uh, we're going to talk about their use in various techniques, and then finally we're going to talk about airbrushing them. But of course, first we're going to start with the basics. So the basics of the line, obviously there's a wide range of colors. There are no metallics, because they're not meant to work like that. So these are all effectively what we would think of as uh, matte paints. Uh, they come in a pretty wide range, you know, let's, let's call it roughly, uh, you know, 30 of them. They're about $8 a pot here in the US, depending on where you are in the world. I'm sure they're priced differently. There's the full range of colors, of course, as we would expect. Uh, there are various versions of white and gray and black and every color of the rainbow. Some of them are more accurately named than others. Uh, so for example, your apothecary white, which is right here, is actually quite gray. It's a really subtle white. Uh, your Achillean green is actually very blue. This is not a green color at all, but I appreciate the thought. It is a blue with a slight amount of green in it, so okay. Uh, and so on and so forth. Whereas things like your uh, Yaden, Yaden, I don't know. This one's actually yellow. <laughs> so the point is, is that uh, they have. You know, they're, they're named whatever they're named. They have funny names. You can look at the pot and pretty much get the idea. Like when you look at that, I don't think you see green. So, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, a quick note about them and their properties. So let's talk about some basic properties of contrast paints. Uh, they have been stated to be quite hydrophobic. Uh, they're meant to be used with the existing medium that's there, the contrast medium is how it's, it's said they're used. And the idea of them is that when you apply one coat of them, they will act kind of like a super shade in that uh, they, have a, they, they have a surface tension such that they will pull away from the large flat spaces and pull into the recesses. That's the idea of the thing, hence providing you contrast. Now, the base way that they're intended to be used according to Games Workshop is over a, uh, over sort of either their gray sear primer or their wraithbone primer, one of which is basically a cold gray white, one of which is sort of a warm yellow white. Uh, and then you can, you know, pick the, put the color over top and the addition of either yellow or blue effectively will give you a different final tone. Uh, we're not going to do that today. When we get into the actual miniatures, what I have here is a bunch of Vestigore, some of which have been Zenithal Prime, or they've all been Zenithal Prime, so there's still plenty of shadow down below. Some of them I did under shading and tones, where you can see there's purple under there. Some of them I did this guy in his final of like a bone color, whereas this I did in dead white. This guy has actually been glossed. I don't know if you can see, because the other thing that the primers claim is that they're very glossy and hence provide a surface smooth enough for it to, to travel over. Some of them are not glossed, as you can see the difference there. Hopefully, if you can see the reflectiveness, the shininess. Um, some of them I went ahead and did the full rundown on where I zenithal primed them, then washed them and dry brushed them. So if you go back to my preparing for your best paint job hobby cheating video, you'll see the steps I took there. So you can see how the definition on him is much more clear. So we've got lots of different ways we're going to do it. Primer wise, I did not use either their wraith bone or anything like that. I primed with an airbrush. All of these were primed with airbrush using Vallejo and Steinal Res primers. The gloss on top of those is just gloss varnish. Um, and in my test so far, it hasn't made any difference. What you need 
to get the effect of paint pulling away, of it thinning out, is a smooth base coat. And often you're not gonna get that out of a rougher like Krylon or something like that out of a rattle can. Um, but as you can see here from this guy, so this is one I painted right before, this just is a quick job where I slapped down some color uh, in about 10 minutes so I had something to, to use. You can see here where the paint pulled away from the top of the skull and gathered down here in the recesses where it's darker. You can see how it pulled away from the tops of the links and is more shadowed inside. You can really see it on the shoulder here where there's this bright white line. Like I obviously ran a whole bunch of, uh, this is Space Wolves Gray right over the top. And you can see where it pulled down into this area and left this line uh, more or less you know, clean, right? Even though I put an even coat over everything. And you can see how it's getting sucked up into recesses here. Uh, and you can see how it's played out here where it's gone more into these recesses. Now, so as far as needing those special primers, you do not. You just need a smooth primer. Uh, something out of an airbrush, I would say, is going to do you just fine. Next comment on the hydrophobic nature of these. Um, the reason that they say they don't want you to mix water with them is because these have a very particular chemical mixture. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but my supposition from having tested them is that there is a fair amount of flow improver in here to break up the sort of molecular cohesion that water normally has and, uh, and, and change the sort of viscosity of it. The more water you add into it, the more of that uh, substance you're you're recreating right the the more you're weakening the effect of the medium that's in here and its ability to effectively have that natural flow and pull and shrinkage right um the same thing is going to happen if you pull normal paints into these so if i mix this with some other paint then what's going to happen is i've added medium that isn't reacting like that that doesn't have the same properties and so you'll see less it doesn't in any way break the paint you still get the color you can still use the paint everything is still completely valid we'll talk about it more in the mixing section but do know that if you mix other types of paints or uh or or too much water you will impact the sort of fundamental nature of the paint. That doesn't make it unusable, it just means you have to be aware of that and adjust your techniques accordingly. Okay, so that's kinda the, the basics of those elements. Obviously, as you can see here, they're still in the pots, whatever, whatever. If you know GW, you know their pots. Um, one really, and, and you know, so as such, you can get them out of here however you want. I still put them on a wet palette. I didn't notice that they soaked up that much additional water or it caused that much of a challenge. They still seem to work more or less the same. Um, I'm sure if you left them on there for a long time, if you had a super wet, wet palette, you could see some uh, diminishment because it will be absorbing water. Um, a final note I wanna make on the basics before we go ahead and get into some basic application is that not all of these colors are equal. So as an example here, let's talk about Dark Angels Green and uh, Agaros Dunes. So this looks like a brown and this looks like a green, which is that's what they are. They look like it because that's in fact the colors that they are. But when you put them on, this is a very weak, thin brown. And so for example, here on this guy, the skull and the bone horns here are the Agaros dunes, okay? Whereas this green is the Dark Angels green here on the back. It is a lot stronger and a lot more intense. If you wanna see another example in practice, we can talk about this Magos purple, which if you look at the uh, wrapping around the ax here. You notice how much of the white you can still see through compared to the green where it has a very, very strong level of coverage. I say that to say that when you're using these, it's important for you to understand the strength of the individual colors. Things like the Dark Angels green, uh, the uh, Griffhound orange, the, uh, which one is it? Yeah, this one. The Flesh Terrors Red. These are all really strong colors. Um, they really, really pack a punch. Um, they will very much 
change what the surface that you're working on to that color. Whereas other ones like uh, like the Agaros Dunes or the Space Wolves Gray are very, very weak colors. So all of the gray and stuff you can see on here, all the sort of pseudo metal is, uh, is that Space Wolves Gray. And as a result, you can see how much weaker that is and how much of the original color still shows through. All right. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're working with them and you think about what you're sort of applying. But let's talk about application. Let's actually do some basic application of these and just talk about the nature of applying contrast paint before we get into any, any fancy schmancy techniques. So we're gonna start with uh, one of our gloss varnished ivory guys here. So we'll go ahead and stick him onto something here. Now I've got a nice big brush. One thing I'll say about working with these is that you can work uh, rather quickly. Let's, uh, let's zoom out just a little bit. There we go. We'll give a little more space to work with. So you can see my colors here, Fire Slayer's Orange, Magos Purple, Dark Angel's Green, Space Wolf's Gray, uh, Achillean Green, i.e. blue, um, and then Agreros Dunes. This is a bright ivory from uh, Pro Acryl, and this is some black ink. We'll use these later on. Uh, so we start out like when we want to apply contrast, I would recommend something like a larger brush. So this is a size six Saks True Flow. This is courtesy, this is the Sam Lens special here. He was nice enough to gift me one of his, uh, his Hobby Lobby brushes when I was visiting recently. And uh, what we want to go for is a nice, even application of the paint. We don't need to be that precious with it. Like, so the way I applied it was you can see that I just kind of gave it a nice, quick coat of it and let the capillary action do the work. It will basically pull into those spaces and sort of start doing what it needs to do. Um, so you can see this is the one that's glossed, so the surface is very smooth, very shiny, um, but because of that, it the paint just kind of runs very quickly into the places. You can see how it's sucked down into those horns right away. Um, one of the elements of having the uh, paint that is a little more uh, thin, like the Agrero's Dunes, is you can get a stronger application, or stronger, uh, what do I want to say, intensity of the color, that's what other word I was looking for, through multiple applications of it. So here you can see that just, you know, one quick application of all of it and I get a nice, simple bone brown color. You can see there how it's pulling down, stuff like that. You can go back in and smooth it out. It's not a problem. Uh, for the flesh tone here, I actually like a little dunes here, plus a little gray plus a little Flesh Terror's Orange. Uh, that just provides for an interesting, a nice, interesting flesh tone. And then we go over his skin. And again, you note that I'm just being very quick. The key is if I you get a healthy amount on there, but you don't let it pool up on any large flats, and that's what you want to watch out for. What you wanna watch out for is those large flat spaces like the muscles themselves. If you see it starting to actually have a big pool on there, you just push it back around. It's one of the reasons I like working with a big large brush like this. It's actually quite easy to then clean up, but you see how much I can suck up into the brush to just keep working all the way around the model. And so with a, a nice healthy application, if we get somewhere we don't want it, just wipe it away, no big deal. And then we're gonna get some on the back of his legs here. On these Beastman models, I always miss the back of the legs when I was batch painting them. Always, 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 those back of those knees. <laughs> okay. His hair, I the all of my Beastmen have blue hair because they're Zinji. So you can see that we just, that uh, a Kelly and green is a really, really strong color. In fact, it's a, a blue. If you're familiar with the plasma fluid color from Badger Minotaur that I'm a big fan of, uh, this is basically that, but it is, uh, 
a little easier to work with and doesn't reactivate with water, so that's nice. It's one of the challenges you have to be kind of careful of with your Badger uh, ghost tents is that they can, they can reactivate a little sometimes. So there we go, got some blue. Kind of touch that to some of those little areas where it's poking out beneath his armor. There we go. Speaking of armor, uh, the Space Wolves Gray makes a really nice base for like sort of metal armor if that's what you're going for. You can see I had gotten some of the brown on there. We'll talk about resetting the color later and how you do that. What happens when you get something where it shouldn't be? It's fine. It's no worry. I see a lot of people talk about how like, oh, if you get this stuff somewhere else, it's, it's just the end of the world. It's not. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Okay. So we just kind of lay down a bunch of that here. This guy has a bunch of different chain stuff like that. So we're just slapping that around. Slappy dappy. Turn him kind of gray. I mean, it doesn't have much of an effect. It's just kind of a, this is, the Space Wolves gray is a very weak uh, gray. So. Then we'll take some of that Dark Angels green. You'll see how much, you see how weak that gray is going on there? Now let's put on some Dark Angels green. You see how much stronger that is. And this is where areas like this is where we have a larger challenge. Like you see how you've got this large flat. It's very easy to get these brush strokes in here. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're always smoothing the paint out. Again, a bigger brush will help do this. We just kind of push it into all these places. Make sure it's nice and spread out. He's got a little bit of that tabard showing there. A little bit showing under there. And you can see how it wants to pull away. Like when I when I go over, you can see it still move. That's what the contrast medium is doing. It's like trying to get it to pull into those spaces. We'll talk about how you navigate with that stuff and make things a little easier. Don't worry. Okay, so we got all that, got all that skin. Let's get a little bit of that purple on there. With the weaker colors, you can be a lot more aggressive with your application. So with stuff like the Magos purple, you can, you can be pretty aggressive. And you notice how it just shrinks right down into those cracks. So if you really want sort of the maximum effect, a little quick touch of things like that gloss varnish is not a terrible idea. Okay. Let's make a little, uh, let's make a little color for the bag here in the belt. He's got a little belt there. Okay, let's see, did I miss anything? Oh, the strings, yeah, we'll get that stuff too. And then, yeah, good. I can't really see those little, oh, yeah, there you go. He has little leather strappies on his, his arm. We'll hit those with that. Brown, cool. All right, and there we go. Like, basic paint job done. If I was going for just like some kind of tabletop standard thing and I just wanted him battle ready, there you go, I just painted a dude. Like, he's he has colors on him. It has some amount of contrast, right? Now, the first thing you'll notice if you've been a long time subscriber to the channel is that this is very similar to techniques I've talked about with Zenithal Priming and uh, and using glazes, it's absolutely. Like the, if you, and that's the first place I'll start. If you've been with me for a while and you're on the uh, thin glazes over a zenithal base coat train, this is going to be very familiar to you. But you can see how, like, just very quickly using these colors, I was able to establish effectively my paint scheme. Right, I got some level of contrast here. Is it high? No, 
No, it's not high contrast. You can see how it's a little stronger than what we get with the shades. Certainly with our colors like our Dark Angels Green, it's far more intense, right? And one of the things we can do is we can One of the things we can do is we can always take a separate a second application of something like the Space Wolves Gray. We can go back over and like if we want to really up that sort of grayness or that contrast, we can get that down in there. Really make sure we have that color because some of these, despite the advertisement saying one thick coat, it's not always actually the way you're going to use it. I don't think I need to tell you that. I'm sure you're aware that. <laughs> You know, that marketing is, is a little bit of haha -ha marketing fun. Um, and there's actually, of course, many ways to use the paint in different fashions. So, again, if I were just going to get ready for a tournament and I were aiming at like tabletop standard, I've got 80 of these guys or something I need to paint by the weekend. Okay, well, I feel like what I achieved here in a few minutes is gonna be just fine on the table, right? Like when I rock up and set down 80 of these dudes in a unit, they should look just fine on the table. They have colors, they have separation, they work, okay? But of course, we're not gonna stop there. And you saw me paint that in real time, right? Like that was about 10 minutes, so it's, it's not hard. Same thing as what I did with this dude. I mean, you can see they look pretty similar. Not too bad, not too shabby. So that's kind of the basics of contrast. It's really easy. Use a bigger brush, get it straight on there. If you see it pooling in the large flat spaces where it, and it's not in that capillary action isn't working, you can always just go back in there, dab it off. Things like, uh, things pay attention to your color intensity and having something like working over a zenithal does make a big difference to this, okay? Um, because of the, just as it did when we were working with thin inks and glazes, it's going to make a big difference here because all of these paints are quite transparent and they will show a large amount of the undershade beneath them. So if you have an existing transition, which you'll see this more when we go to the guy with who's been dry brushed, um, you're going to get a bigger effect. That is to say, the more underlying contrast the model already has, the broader the contrast will be at the end because all of these paints are quite fairly translucent, okay? Um, beyond that, that's it. That's the simple application. That's the basics, right? It works exactly as it says on the tin. It creates some minor contrast. It gets things battle ready in a very fast amount of time. I mean, you saw me paint this right in front of you. This feels pretty battle ready to me. Like, this looks like a lot of armies I've seen on a lot of tournament tables. Perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with it at all, right? You can see we got some muscle definition and shade and color. Uh, one final note on this in the basics. Because this paint is so thin, and because this paint pulls apart in the way it does uh, to create this contrast, it is very fragile. So if you're gonna come back in and dry brush over the top of this now, like after you've laid down an application, I would highly recommend laying down a varnish first, okay? Um, because the the nature of these paints is that they can quite easily be damaged. Um, from what I understand, they are an order of magnitude thinner, like literally an order of magnitude thinner in the way that they dry in like the microns or however it's measure, me measured. I don't, I don't know how paint thickness is measured, but in whatever it's measured in, it is one tenth the thickness of most of the normal paints in the range. That makes it much more fragile. So laying down a quick coat of varnish, just matte varnish or something like that, is going to make a big difference to uh, to its overall durability. Uh, and obviously, a lot of people are then frightened when I say that, but I'm, what if I varnish? I can't varnish. We're at the end. How can I dry brush over top? Oh my God, I'm freaking out. Relax. 
You can varnish your figure any number of times. Doesn't matter. I varnish all the time in midstream. If you've seen the big like Keeper of Secrets I did at some point in time or any of those other big monsters, I varnished that Keeper of Secrets no less than a dozen times throughout the painting process before the painting was finished. I mean that absolutely literally. So it's fine. So a quick varnish and then you can continue on doing other things and that'll keep your, your contrast paints nice and solid. So with that being said, that brings us through the basics. Uh, so we will be back in just a second. And we're gonna talk about mixing. Back in a moment. All right, we're back. And now we're gonna talk about mixing. So I've got a, we've got a fresh uh, Bestigore here. Here's our previous two boys. The one I painted before and the one that I painted just now. So there we go, just for reference to a few seconds ago. <laughs> and now we've got this guy. We're gonna talk about how we take it beyond. And when to do that, we're gonna mix a little. So the first thing is you already saw me doing some of this before, like with the flesh, um, I was mixing the uh, a little bit of the brown to get a nice brown tone and a little bit of the uh, Fire Slayer. What is this? Sorry, this is the, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is Griffhound Orange over here. I apologize. Uh, for a nice orange tone, all flesh is sort of has an orange tone at the base. And then a little bit of the Space Wolves Gray to kind of cool it down because I want my skin tone to be uh, nice and gray. So what I end up with is something like that. And then I just slap it on there and bada boom, we get a nice skin tone. And you can see how it's still quite warm even despite the addition of all that gray. And this is where my previous note, sorry that ax is in the way there as I was touching his face. He's this big old ax. I didn't think these guys through. They seemed like a good option because they got so many different textures on them. I was like, oh, these guys are gonna be perfect. I have a whole unit of Bestigores I never painted. They've got flesh, they've got armor, they've got cloth, they've got hair, they've got fur. Man, I couldn't ask for a more perfect model. And then I had this big giant stupid ax is in the way. <laughs> well, such is life, I suppose. At any rate, uh, the thing to be, you know, to, to understand about your mixing is just as here, you can see this is still a very warm tone, right? Despite the fact I added in a ton of that gray, um, that's because that Space Wolves gray is so very, very weak. And that Fire Slayer, or sorry, that Griffhound orange, I apologize, Griffhound orange, is so very, very strong. And so again, understanding and experimenting with the various colors to know which of the range you've gotten uh, that is very powerful and potent is going to be quintessential to your uh, proper use of mixing because it won't always come out exactly like it looks on the palette. That is always one of the challenges with thinner, more translucent paints. Uh, on the palette, they may appear rather one color, but then when they actually go on the model and they're thin and they're over, you know, there's a undershade that's working with them, they'll slightly change and probably have a slightly different shade to them. So some experimentation is likely in the cards for you. Now, that being said, if you use one of the, the strong colors straight, you're gonna get a more accurate read, okay? So there's our little guy. His flesh is all good to go. Yay. Sorry, I'm just grabbing my paper towel here. Pop the egg. All right. So, um, the, so we know we can mix the various colors together. It doesn't hurt at all. The contrast paints can all go together without issue. So for example, I, you saw me turn his hair blue before, right? That's fine. I could also take some of the blue and mix it with a little of that very powerful Dark Angels green to get a nice darker color. And I could push that down in the lower parts to kind of create a softer tint to that at the lower areas and maybe here near the base. You'll see how that green kind of wins out there a little bit. And then wipey 
go back to just the blue and we could pull that out to the end. So the colors mix with each other just fine. No issue at all. Go nuts. Have fun combining and mixing your contrast paints. Which leads to my next point. You probably don't need the whole range of contrast paints. I mean, if you want to pick up the whole range, hey, go nuts. I'm not going to take money out of GW's pocket, all right? But if you're comfortable with mixing paint, if you feel all right about sort of getting colors by mixing things together, then you should be able to achieve a lot of what you want solely by, uh, solely by mixing things together of the various colors. So if you pick up some of the strong primaries, I would highly recommend that Achillean green, that actual blue color. Like you can see how that looks on the on my paper towel. That is not green. Um, at any rate, I really love that color. It's, it's one of my favorite colors in the range I've played with thus far. It's so unbelievably intense. And you know I love nice bright colors like that. So that one's a real winner for me. Um, but you can certainly mix them together. Now, let's talk about what happens when we get this situation. Dun, dun, dun. Oh no, I've gotten some blue in a place where it doesn't belong. How with my thin contrast paints shall I ever cover it up when I apply the very thin Agreros dunes on top that is my brown color? Why nothing happens. I can still see that green or still see that blue very clearly turns a little bit green because of course there's some yellow in the Agrero's dunes and yellow plus blue make <gasps> did you say it out loud okay good uh but yes the point is is that when that happens you're going to be hard pressed to cover over anything with the ex with just contrast paints now they do sell wraithbone and gray sear in pots and you can certainly buy those uh, and somebody else had mentioned uh, on some video review somewhere, I don't remember where it was, but had effectively said it's an eraser. Those are erasers. I actually agree with this statement and think that that is an excellent summation of what those two colors are. The trick is you don't actually need those two colors. Again, if you want to buy any of that stuff, go ahead. I'm not ever here to stop you. If you feel better having the actual product, knock yourself out. It is your money. You do as you would like. However, what you really need is just an ivory or a gray. As always with our previous, so if you go back and watch some of my speed painting with inks, shades, and glazes video, I talk about how ivory, having a nice strong ivory, is effectively your eraser. It's your reset to neutral. So I can come in here and just take some of that, go right over the top, bang, bang, boom, it's gone done and dusted, right? So any kind of ivory will achieve this and then you can go right back over the top and you're good, all right? So no issue there. Now, the next thing we wanna talk about though is mixing these with normal paints. That is to say what happens when I take my contrast paints and I mix in some normal colors. Uh, you know, something like the white ivory here or the black ink. And the answer is a lot of good things happen, to be quite straightforward. Um, they are quite effective uh, at mixing together. They actually work well. We'll cover some of the, the some of that in the uh, blending section when we get to that, because there's some really, really cool tricks you can do here. But for now, we're just gonna talk about straight, simple mixes. For example, here on the top, I have the uh, I have his horns and his horns like obviously I did this sort of contrast all down them but I probably actually want some variation there now I could certainly get to that by just applying another coat of contrast but there's there's going to be some limit to just how far that will go right like I could darken the lower part of the horn there I could also come in afterward and apply a, a traditional shade. So I could come in with something like an Agrax Earth Shade or something like that and apply it to the lower part of the horns. And, and you know, down here. And that would also be fine. These shades work just fine over the top of these. Alternatively, I could do some mixing. So I could take my Dunes color here, this nice subtle brown. I could take a pinch of my ivory, mix it in find a nice color I like. By the way, I want to really point something out and see if this is going to read on camera. 
when I when I have a lot of this Agrero's Dunes and then I grab a little bit of ivory and pull it in there, what I see happening is the paint phew, spreads out. This is the same effect you get if you're very if you ever use flow improver and you you pull flow improver into your paint, it'll it looks exactly the same. Like the way that the paint reacts on the palette is exactly the same. Um, which is what tells me that there's obviously a lot of flow improver in these paints. So now that it's mixed together, I can come in and I can push up there and kind of blend. And what's nice is it actually ends up being a pretty good way to create a nice soft blend because I can keep mixing in greater levels of the ivory with my Agrero's Dunes. So now you have a nice little progression there, you see? And it becomes actually a pretty easy way to do a nice subtle blend right up to the top. So very quickly, I'm able to establish a little more contrast. Oh, that's right, folks. Come for the tutorial, stay for the really, really, really bad puns. Okay. So. Just soak it up a little bit of that extra paint because I didn't need all of it on there. Now, a note though about mixing this with normal paints. As I mentioned at the top, the more other normal paint you mix into it, the less it will naturally pull apart on its own. Okay, the, na the less it will act like we would sort of want it to as contrast, the less it will sort of act in the nature of how we think of the contrast paints working. One of the uh, elements that I've, I've discovered is that I actually like working with them with kind of just the extremes. So that is to say, the reason I've set my palette up like this, I am just killing this space while it's great tonight. We're gonna just get out a bunch more of it. There we go. Um, one of the reasons that I've, I've worked like this is because I found having sort of a white and a black, you know, maybe a few other colors here and there where I want something intense, uh, pretty much allows me to do most of the work I need. Um, I can, I can basically create all the shades and tints that I need. The shades, shades are created by adding black or, uh, complementary colors, contrasting colors, and getting darker elements, adding in very deep, deep blues or reds, purples, things like that. In this case, we're just gonna use straight black. That isn't actually what I would often use, but in the case when we're being speedy, it's fine. Tints are created by adding white. So we can kind of control everything we need just with two normal paints. And the trick is whatever we do, we can then always slap more contrast over the top and end up in a good place. So I knew you were gonna run off the side. I knew it. I knew it as soon as I put it that close to the edge that it was gonna to wanna to get all down here. I could just feel it. I could just feel it. Could you see it? Could you feel it happening? Were you watching it and going, no? Okay. So let's talk about something like armor. Here is a good example, like we'll do this shoulder blade and this wrist. So we'll turn on the same kind of steel gray. The Space Wolves with a little blue in it actually makes a really nice like gray steel armor. I quite like it. It's very subtle. Um, but we can also we'll work in an area that's on the camera. Take it and take a little bit of that white and bring it in there. We'll mix that up. You see how it kind of spreads apart there. The more contrast is in it, the more it's flowing. And then I can come in here and make a nice layer. I could also uh, take some of my Space Wolves Gray, go right here. And uh, we'll grab a little black ink and we'll pull that in there. And then what we'll do is we'll go and we'll establish a very dark layer down here. Okay. You can see how I get some really strong shadows. So again, we have lots of different options of what we wanna do 
with these when we mix them together. So they will mix with normal items, just don't expect them to perform in exactly the same ways. It's perfectly fine as long as you know that, that you know that's gonna be the result. I can always come back, I can always apply another layer of contrast over top or something like that to reactivate sort of the nature of that paint. It's not like the second you touch some other paint, you lose the property, it's just the more of a different paint you mix in, the more you kind of diminish its natural flow, unless, by the by, you actually bring the flow aid sort of back into it. And that's kind of the next thing I'll say about mixing, which is mixing additives. Because we're not always just mixing with other contrast paints or with other, uh, or with other types of normal paint, we might also want to mix additives in. So the question might become, well, what happens if I mix in things like medium? Well, the simple answer on medium is it works great. Like there's no, there's no question there. I mean, the product line comes with a medium that's made to be mixed into it. So you can always, uh, you can certainly always go get that contrast medium and that's effectively your glaze medium or your thinner medium or just your standard acrylic medium, you know, whatever. Basically it's just, it's adding more non, <laughs> It's adding more of the same stuff that's not paint. Also, I just realized I painted a part of him that wasn't uh, that wasn't actually skin, or sorry, that wasn't armor as armor. So there, very quickly, we reset that while it was still wet. <laughs> Ta-da! Okay. Anyway, um, the uh, so mixing it in with additives is certainly possible, like when it comes to those mediums. But you might also want to take something like some flow improver. So here, basically we can up the, the we can up the ante on its flow ability. That's a word, right? It's flowness. It's sick flow. So we can get some flow improver into our brush here. That's just my nice flow improver. That's my war colors flow flow improver, which I quite like. We take some of that dark green, that uh, dark angels green. And let's really up that flow. And also, of course, we'll thin it because I've replaced a bunch of the paint with additive. And now what'll happen is you'll see when I apply it, one, it's far more translucent than the last time I applied it. So that's number one. And number two, you'll watch as it really, really, really just sucks right into those shadows. And it covers very little. Now, a note about this, this paint will become real sketchy if you mix too much because it wants to draw away from the from the, the flats so badly at this point that it will start to pool, like you can see what it's doing there on the back, all right? When you go this thick like I just did, and if you try to just literally put it over the top with some kind of flow improver and just call it a day, like that's all I'm doing, I just went, and I'm done, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get these really big tide marks as it sort of pulls together. However, if you then come back in and just kind of clean up the large flats where it's pulled together, then what you get instead is a nice, thin, smooth, light glaze where the color has very much focused down in the shadows. Again, I thinned it way, way, way down with Flow Improver just to sort of make a point. But of course, you could do, uh, you wouldn't have to do that much, right? We could take a little less. I still have some Flow Improver in my brush. Let's go for a much higher ratio here. So you can see the difference between those two paints as far as thinness goes. I'll wick off the excess. And now when I apply it, it's much stronger in its tone, but it's still gonna flow nice and smooth. And it will still have some of the same properties. So this can actually be a good trick to reinforce your colors. So if you have highlights you wanna do, so let's say for example that top part there, you want that to stay lighter, you can just use progressively uh, less intense, or sorry, you can use progressively more intense versions of it and just very quickly blend it down to where I'm only covering the, the, the areas in shadow and then the higher areas still retain more of the white.
because more of the undershade shows through. So lots of options here on how to mix. Yes, you can use different additives. Um, I haven't tried every different flow improver with this. I've just tried the ones I like and noticed that like it does certainly work and will get into a very, very thin glaze, but you do wanna be careful. I noticed when I was sort of experimenting with it that if I just applied it straight over the top, it would cause some challenges. Um, it is much better in the end to uh, make sure you're watching it, going back with your brush and cleaning up any sort of tide marks as it's still wet. Um, this stuff does take a little while to dry. As a final note to just continue on our world of mixing, uh, where up here you can see we had our ivory with our white. Let's push that up even more. You can see how that's reacting, how it sort of shrunk up again because there was that much flow improver in it. Now that we're completely dry, I can come in with my more ivory mix. I can create more of a quick highlight. If we have, if we want to just talk about basically a layering technique and very quickly I can sketch out some fun highlights on this guy. Again, we're just gonna be fast. We're going for quick paint jobs here, All right? So now I've got some nice highlight to that armor. Maybe we'll get the edge of this thing. All right. And then let's go ahead and get a deeper shadow. So here we'll add in a little more black ink to our mix. So we get a nice deep, dark mix of those two. And we can come in and really bring those shadows down. So we can just kind of work the armor there have these different areas get cast in some much deeper shadow. Okay. Now, and then obviously if you like, you can go back to your original apothecary gray and just kind of smooth over everything and it'll help bring it all together. You can do that same trick with just any color. I happen to be doing it with the gray here. But again, you could do the same thing with anything. Basically, what you're doing here is you're re-intensifying your, uh, your undershade and then putting more contrast over the top to just kind of get a higher level of contrast than what you would get otherwise. All right, so that's mixing. Pretty straightforward. Yes, you can mix the paints with each other. Yes, you can mix them with normal paints. The higher you increase the ratio, the less sort of other type of contrast you'll see. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and apply the purple here while I'm wrapping up my mixing section, just so all these guys are actually painted. Uh, and you, yes, you can mix it with various additives. Um, I, I will say that like the other, other just regular types of medium don't really seem to work as well because again, when you're adding other types of medium that aren't like the contrast medium, um, you're just basically adding other paint that doesn't have paint in it, right? And so what happens is it's not as strong of a, uh, you're, you're again diminishing like their particular recipe. There's nothing sorcerous about their recipe. It's just, I don't know exactly what it is. I'm sure it's some mix of flow improver and water and a couple other elements, but not knowing means I haven't, you know, exactly replicated it. So the point being is that uh, if you just want to be safe and get a nice, easy thin with something that you know is going to still pull in the right direction and kind of work for you, well then, uh, the contrast medium seems a simple enough investment. If you don't want to worry about that, you can just use any medium or flow improver or even other inks or paints or stuff like that and you will get a good effect. So there we go. Number three, he's done. Mixing is good to go and you can see how the armor has a really nice effect when dry, I think. Again, some good contrast there. Uh, but next up, we're going to talk about blending. So back in just a moment. All right, we're back. 
And now it's time for uh, my favorite part. It's time to talk about something I am real excited about, and that is blending. Everybody's seemingly least favorite thing to do, but the thing that makes your fingers look the best. I went ahead and base coated some more of these guys because I think that when we talk about getting battle ready, you know, or just having figures up to sort of snuff where you can put them on the table, I think what really sells it is often when you have a good number of them in a unit. And I think you can see how even, by the way, I didn't spend more than like 10 minutes on these guys. These were just ultra fast 10 minute base coats. I think you can see how when you put them all together, you know, they look pretty good. They look certainly like they're ready to go. Like, you know, I could put it on the table in a game and be happy enough. I have painted figures. Whatever uh, the quality, it is infinitely better than gray plastic. I am absolutely sure of that. But what we're going to talk about is how we go from something that looks like this... to something that looks more like this guy, okay? So in between, I also, in between recording, I also went ahead and did some more work on this dude. And you can see how what we've done is up a lot of the contrast. Now, could he be better? Sure, of course, absolutely. We could still take him a lot higher. But getting him to something like this was a relatively straightforward process. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about how we use the Paints data blend. Of course, one of the things that made this a little more time consuming was I decided to do all sort of NMM armor on him, but I thought that'd be a fun challenge and we'll talk about that more in techniques. But first, blending. Okay, so what's on our palette here besides some Agrero's Dunes that is quickly miscoloring all of my water? Uh, because apparently, if I put paint near the edge of my. Uh, wet palette it's just like it's going in i don't know why but it happens all right there we go solve that little problem okay so the we have all of our colors that you had before so that is to say we have our agrero's dunes our magos purple space wolf gray we added some apothecary white uh, here is our Dark Angels green, our Achelian green, i.e. blue, uh, some of the Griffhound orange, and we've added the Fire Slayer flesh. And then here to work with, I have some heavy body acrylic. And this is my Golden Artist heavy body acrylic titanium white. Uh, heavy body acrylics are a wonderful paint that is very useful for a lot of purposes, as we'll see today. And then I have some regular ivory, which is just a nice warm tone ivory from Pro Acryl, as well as a coal black, which is just the their black. Okay. And we're going to show how we can do a whole bunch of different fun stuff with these. Are you serious over here, Brown? You're you're really testing my patience here, Agreros Dunes. Let me tell you what, I'm about to send you back to Agreros, wherever that is. Agaros. This has got to be killing people that I'm mispronouncing this thing when it's probably a real place or like in the 40k world or whatever, but I don't know what it is. If you know where it is, you can you can uh, put it in the comments if you like. Go ahead. Share it down there. I would love to learn something about what these paints mean. Because they always use all these words and I, I never know exactly what they are. And that of course immediately flowed right back into the same spot where it was before. So we're just going to let this be. And if it colors my water brown a little bit, who cares? All right, so let's talk about blending. So we're going to grab this little homeboy here. Actually, let's see. Who's a nice... Here we go. We'll grab our, our unit champion. He's a fun one. All right. Unit champion. So, he's got a nice big upraised axe. Got all this stuff going on. And the first thing we're going to talk about is a little bit of... Uh, we're going to talk about sort of the, your traditional blending methods, right? And a lot of people, when they think about blending, they go, Oh, did you wet blend that? Did you this, that? Like, how? what kind of blending are you using? And my answer is always and has always been yes. And by that, I simply mean... I, I've used a ton of different blending techniques on it because I always do. The reality is I don't, like I very rarely just use one form of, of, of blending on something. That's just not how it works. When you're trying to get a, a truly solidly blended effect, 
you end up needing to use lots of different blends. Now, good news with the contrast paints is that they support this really, really well. Um, I actually really like the way that they blend. So will it blend? Yes, yes it will. Uh, so we're gonna start with uh, a little bit of wet blending and we'll do it right here on the back of the ax because that'll be nice and visible. So assuming we want this to be a big uh, sort of non-metallic ax, right? Then what we can do is we can put some, some dark uh, kind of, let's see, how would we want this thing lit? He's holding it like that. So that should be a light point and that should be dark. Great. And you can wet blend with normal paints or with different kinds of the, uh, the, the contrast paints all together. So let's get into it. We'll start, and again, I'm not gonna work with any kind of medium or anything like that. This has no retardant or anything like that. It's just, I'm gonna take some black I'm gonna drop some of that black on there. If you watched my recent speed painting base coats video, you're gonna be immediately familiar with this. And we wipe the brush. Then we're gonna take a little bit of that Space Wolves gray, which is actually very blue. And we're gonna just start pulling it down. Now, the effect that some of these have will be different depending on the strength of the color. As I mentioned before, some of these colors are way stronger than others, right? Like the, uh, the this Space Wolf is actually quite weak. Uh, quick note, by the way, on the Apothecary White and the Space Wolves Gray. If you're gonna use those, you need to mix the living bejesus out of them. They really like to separate. So just a, just a note. Um, I put a couple little agitators in there and I found that really helped. Uh, but you can see, I can just keep working a bunch of wet paint on here, right? I'm trying to make sure there's no reflection from my overhead light in the camera, sorry. Haven't put my brush into the water at all yet. Keep just every so often when you see my brush go off camera, I'm just whippy wiping it on a paper towel. And there we go. Is it a perfect blend? No, no, it's not that. Is it pretty decent for a few second wet blend? Yeah, it's pretty good. For running basically from near white all the way to black, I would call that pretty good. Like that's a nice starting blend. Uh, so certainly we could continue to refine and improve. Let's do it again, shall we? Let's do the other, let's do the blade of the ax. That's a little shorter space. So this time we'll start in the other direction. We'll put a little white out there where we want that. Then we'll go into our apothecary white, which is actually a little gray. Yes, I'm using ivory with gray. I wanna have a little bit of a warm light, a little bit of cold reflection. It's my ax, I can do what I want to, much like my party. And then finally, I'll just grab some of the black here. Work a little bit more of that ivory up there. And there we go. We got a nice blend right across the right across the blade. All right? And if we want to finish it off. We can use our standard techniques, like I have uh, some white ink over here off camera. Grab a sharper brush and some of my white ink. We'll give it a quick edge highlight. One technique I will say these are not great for is edge highlighting their desire to sort of pull away and to be very liquid and to sort of like kind of do what they want to, like these paints very much have a mind of their own to some degree, means they're not really gonna be your best bet for that. Uh, I have, in my experimentation, just stuck to my 
traditional items for edge highlighting and drawing sharp thin lines, which is like, uh, you know, inks and flow improver and stuff like that. And I found that on the whole, that works pretty well. And that's okay, you don't need one paint to do everything. All right, not the sharpest line I've ever drawn, but you get the idea. Then we just let it dry. And we're good. So you can see how like with something like wet blending, it really does make tasks like that pretty easy, right? Now, the stronger the color, the more you have to kind of pay attention to what you're doing. What I mean by that is like here on this part of the, the blade, you can see where the paint pulled away from the edge and gave me a nice light edge. That's a really nice effect where it kind of gathered down here and you know, kind of sucked up there. But we can push that farther. By just very quickly running some lines down here and then when the paint is still wet we grab some of that little bit of that magos purple and we just very quickly smooth out the edge right and now we have an even stronger sort of contrast if we really want to push that up and a lot of times in very small spaces that's really all we're talking about it's that little kind of element right now the other very common way that you blend is with glazes. Um, glazes are a very, very, very established way to sort of blend things together. You get yourself some thin paint, you blend it out. So here, we're gonna grab a different little, different little homeboy. I need a different dude, no. I need one that has green, there you go, perfect. I'm sorry, I needed one that had both a, a top and a bottom of green, because this will really display what I, what I wanna show you. So, here, he's all green. You can see he's got, it's not easy, but somehow he's all green. He's got a bunch of robe on. So what we'll do is we're gonna take some of that ivory and we're just gonna place it wherever we want there to be highlights. Kinda up here, we'll push into those areas, top of his booty his bestigore booty. Best booty. Kind of catch the edges of the fabric here. Kind of get the bottom of that thing. Okay, so there we go. We got some really, really ostentatious kind of, you know, bright over highlighted highlights on there, right? While we're at it, let's run a few down the edge of his hair. Why the heck not? It's right here, right? And we'll get the bottom of his little tufts on his feet. Okay, so now that we got all that kind of highlighted, over highlighted, like obviously that looks terrible. I don't disagree, internet world. But what we can do is we can take some of that green and we can thin it out. Now there's a bunch of different options we can use here. We could use water. We could use some of the contrast medium. We could use some you know, other medium or flow aid or something like that. In this case, I'm just using a little bit of generic medium. It's not the contrast medium, it's just medium because I don't actually need it to be restretching itself out. And instead what I do is I just apply a nice thin glaze of that paint over everywhere I just made ivory. And because I've like lessened the effect of its sort of shrinkage, you can see that it does go on pretty evenly and makes a nice glaze. You can see where that lighter area still shows through. Alternatively, I can mix just a little bit of black into my glaze 
and I can build out my shadows. So your same sorts of blending tricks when it comes to things like uh, lights and darks, those are still absolutely at play. Nothing goes away because you're using contrast paint. So if you started with contrast and you wanna go ahead and refine your color a little more and you're worried about matching, you can use this to your advantage. You can use the fact that the more normal paint you mix in, the more normal the paint acts. It's so naturally transparent that it, uh, that it works really well in this, in this regard. It's like it becomes a glaze very easy. It doesn't take much effort or tricks. You don't have to be a master of, of, of the technique to get it, okay? The other thing you could obviously do with these glazes is you could continue, like I could lay down some ivory again, depending if you're a glaze blender. Okay. And we could just kind of glaze it one more time. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. We could kind of glaze it one more time there, right on the edge lines. And now we've got that nice, smooth highlight right up top. You can see how it falls into the shadow. That's not just the light from above. That is the real shadow, right, that we painted on. And there we go. Same with the blue hair, something like that Achillean blue. So again, most time we're just, you know, yes, it will change its properties. One of the things I hear about with this is you can't mix water with it. That is not true. You certainly can, but if you mix water with it, it will stop acting exactly like the contrast paints often, which can actually be advantageous. When you're just trying to do a quick thin glaze, this is actually really easy to glaze with. Because like I said, all of these are made to be very transparent. Much like inks, they actually work really well for glazes. In the same way, I, I liked inks for glazing over undershades because they're naturally highly transparent. The same thing is in play here. Okay, so you can see the much brighter tip on the end of that, on the end of his little feetsies, his little feet tufts. All right, brought it right back into blue. Similarly, if you've watched my channel before, you know I talk a lot about interference colors and pop colors and making steel look more interesting. So let's take some of this Achillean green, also known as bright blue, and let's go ahead and make this axe look a little shiny with a glaze. Let's give it some of that, let's give it some of that blue feel. And you see how we can just glaze that blue right in there. Nice and easy. Does it every time. Right? And now it's got that wonderful light sheen to it. Okay? So, final and most important, or most neat thing we can do with our blending, with uh, with our contrast, is we're going to talk a little about loaded brush. Nope, come back! Don't run away! Dun dun dun! This this is killing me, by the way. This is literally this is the saddest thing I've ever seen. This is making me so angry right now. What are we going to do? Anyway, so um. With blending, let's talk a little bit about loaded brush. Whoosh. Other side of the axe. So, loaded brush is uh, a technique very well known for basically uh, having multiple different colors of paint in your brush at the same time. The key to loaded brush is that the paint that's down here in the brush needs to be quite liquid, but quite pigment rich, and the paint that's at the top needs to be quite thick and quite dense. Traditionally, I would often use things like inks in my loaded brush because they satisfied that. The advantage to using something like contrast is that it's actually not as, um, it's actually not as runny as ink. It's because it's slightly thicker, it's a little more paint-like, it actually has this really nice balance. So I can get a good dollop of that into my brush. I can then bring my paper towel over, can wick off the excess, so now we have that. 
Then I can grab a little spot. That was just some space holes gray, by the way. I can grab a little spot of that white. Let's flippy dippy that axe over so I can hit the spot I want to highlight. And then we just come in here. We just move it back and forth. And there we get that nice blend. We can then pull back into the full apothecary gray. If you want, we can go the opposite direction. Let's get some apothecary gray. Let's grab a little dabble do ya of that coal black. And now this time, let's go from the other side. Right, And very quickly, we're able to achieve a nice run all the way through the colors of white to black through the apothecary gray as a filter. If we need to smooth anything out, it ends up being an excellent tool to do so. And that's kind of the final note that I want to make when we talk about blending. The contrast paints, the weaker ones, as I said, because these very much divide into strong and not strong. Like, I, I don't know another way to say it. But the reality is, is that like, some of these are simply crazy intensely pigmented and really, really generate their color. Some of them are weak, weak, weak. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean like, it's the reality of the thing. They're very weak in the way that they apply their color. It's not bad it can be it just needs to be known there's nothing wrong with it being a, a light color some paints are just always going to be slightly weaker and that's fine we can use that to our advantage as long as we know it and so what this does is it means that we can use the weaker colors like the apothecary white and the space wolves gray to act like a sort of glaze when we want to smooth out a blend. One of the things I was doing earlier, when I just kind of was laying down some dark tones, was I was actually over highlighting much like you saw me, or overshadowing and making using really thick colors, like you saw me do in my uh, speed painting base coats video. And then I was just coming in with the apothecary gray and smoothing it all out. So for example, let's talk about down here on this leg plate, that's nice and visible. Let's grab a little bit of that HBA, a little bit of that ivory. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and add in where we want our highlights to be. Nice and overtly strong. Okay, so you can see we got real strong highlights placed. If you're using heavy body acrylic, don't lick your paint. Shouldn't lick your paint probably generally anytime, but especially don't lick your paint when you're using heavy body acrylics. Even I don't do that. They don't call it titanium white for, you know, for no reason. So then I laid in some black. So you can see how we've got this very extreme sort of transition, right? Now, I could keep going with that wet blend, but as that paint already sets, that's okay. I can come into something weaker like the apothecary gray, and then I can just sort of glaze right through the middle, and because it's naturally transparent, but because it also, the way that it draws off the flats, it will just kind of filter the white and give me a nice smooth transition in a manner of a few seconds, All right? Easy peasy. So, whether we're talking about wet blending or glazing or loaded brush blending or anything like that, the reality is these do all of that and can be used in all of that. And that's what I really want to you know, sort of impress upon everybody here. 
I know the marketing on this is a lot of like, well, you know, you can just do one thick coat and you can get everything battle ready. Awesome, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm all about more painted figures. There's absolutely no problem with getting your stuff up to ready to put on the table by getting it painted. That is a great thing. And any amount of paint and to any quality is always better than not. Never let anybody big time you think that they're better than you because they painted better than you or something like that. Everybody's at their own place on their hobby journey. And if you took the time and you painted your figures, then that's great. Like to me, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing and is to be commended because not everybody has the same amount of time to practice, to work. People have lives and kids and everything like that. And if this as a tool helps people paint more, gets people results that they're happy with, and lets people play with painted fun armies that they're proud of, then this product is an absolute and complete unmitigated success in my mind. Okay? All right, so that's just my little soapbox speech here in the middle of me blending this stuff out. But you can see how that can be done and it gives us a nice option. So over here on the left, I did a little more wet blending. Over here on the right, I glazed it a little more, but in the end, we can end up in about the same place. Yeah, and there's the ax all nice and dry. Came out rather good, I think. We still need to edge it, but that's fine. All right, so that is our blending section. So next up, we're gonna talk about other sorts of techniques that we can use this in. And by that, I mean we're with certain effects or things like that. So I'll be back in just a moment and we're gonna keep going with just some other kinds of interesting ways to use these paints um, that, uh, if this were my BuzzFeed list, it'd be like seven unusual ways to use contrast paints. Back in a minute. All right, we're back. And now let's talk about some other techniques we can do with these paints. So one of them you already saw me do before, which was, you know, non-metallic metal. If you have a problem sort of getting your blends and stuff smooth enough, these can be a great way to work. So you can see here how I've done it. Now, is this NMM amazing? No, it was a pretty quick rush job, but I think it works overall and communicates the you know, the, the shininess of it. I think if you're looking for a, a simple non-metallic scheme, these can be great. Again, this was done all with the addition of some actual white, like the uh, HBA white here uh, and the, uh, and black, but then beyond that, it was all contrast paints. Uh, they really make it easy to smooth, as you saw in the blending periods there, they really make it easy to smooth out between the colors. You can, of course, get gold as well. Here's a just quick, simple gold I sketched out on his arm, so you can see what that looks like. That's using uh, a lot of the Fire Slayer flesh, a little bit of the e and in yellow, and then some ivory, and some of the um, Agaros dunes. Uh, so just a quick job there, but I think it, you know, again, communicates the, the concept. You can see that, that what that looks like. It's a good way to play around with your NMM because it is, as you saw in the blending step, it is fairly easy to use it to wet blend, to glaze over, to do these kind of tricks where you can, which is the kind of diff things you need to employ in mass to get that non-metallic sheen. The next thing that you can use contrast for is something you probably already saw here but you notice how I have this ax kind of colorized as though it's a bit old and the head of it's kind of weathered. This is a good trick when doing sort of NMM or even metallic paints or anything like this where you have a large flat and you want to make the blade expressive, but you want to keep this fairly flat. You don't want this to just stay gray. So having a color worked in here is a great way to go. You notice it also sets the blade off against the hilt. But if you choose, you could always have it actually extend to sort of the hilt as well. Here with all of these, I've just used some Agaros Dune and some uh, Griffhound Orange to just add a bit of color and texture into here. Now, different than using, say, Typhus Corrosion and Riser Rust, so here if we look at an ax I haven't done anything to yet, right? The difference here is going to be 
I might want to take some of my black. If I were using true metallic metals, I would still do the same thing, just probably with ink or something. And I'd want to run it up to the edge. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd want to run it up to the edge just to make sure that I had the edge nice and dark. Okay. And we'd push that towards each edge there. Okay. But... There we are. And we can smooth that out a little bit later. But then what we can do to create more visual interesting on that flat part of the axe head is I can come in here and I can drop some of that brown contrast. This is the, again, the Agaros Dunes. Um, I can drop some of that here or in here. It's going to make the axe feel, or the weapon in this, yeah, these are axes, but the weapon feel older. You don't want to put this on the cutting edge because it would tend to get, you know, stay cleaner. Take some of that Griffhound orange. Maybe put a couple spots of that in there around. Almost stippling it like we would a regular rust pattern. Maybe we'll put some around some of these bolts. Then we just let it dry. And when it dries, we can kind of... It's a little bit of a hard edge. We can always just smooth it out there. There we go. When it dries, what you'll get is a color effect that looks something like that. Right? Where it's clear that there's a little bit of discoloration. And what's happened is this person isn't taking the best care of their weapons. It's not old, it's not a, you know, Nurgle infested, rusty, crusty piece of junk. But it's, you know, it certainly communicates that it is exposed to the elements, it's weathered, and it's not properly upkept. Okay? So, that's another thing you can do, that kind of weathering. By the way, these same colors, this Agraros Dunes and orange can also be used for streaking. If you put a nice drop onto the side of a vehicle or something and then drag it down, you can create nice streaks. It will naturally shrink up as the as the thing sucks up to try to as that that as it pulls together doing what it, you know, sort of the contrast paint wants to do. Um, it will actually create a really nice effect uh, of a streak going down the side. There, by the way, you can see is that orange drying, and you see we get that really nice effect there. Okay. A little bit of a... There we go. There's a little bit of a mark where I left the other paint to dry, but that's all right. We can fix that. So it's a it's an, an interesting way to get to NMM if you're not really comfortable with it, if you're just experimenting with it. It can be a nice way to learn that technique or to help smooth... Let me say it this way. If the challenge you're having with NMM isn't light placement, but it's things like your blending... You can see here how this could make that a little bit easier. Now, uh, you can also do things like color gems with the contrast paints. Any of the really intense colors like Dark Angels Green, Akellen Green, uh, the Flesh Terrors Red. All of those can work over gems if you lay down just basically paint the top of whatever the gem is black and the bottom like an ivory and then you just one coat over the top and you're good to go. Uh, and then you, well, a little white dot in the dark corner, or dark side. My point to say all that is these paints have a lot of uses beyond just how we think of them as being like one coat to place on. I've mentioned that you can thin them down to glazes. There's a lot of really interesting colors. They're naturally transparent. They can work great as glazes on skin if you want to add some purple tone to your skin, or some more orange, or brown, right? I talk a lot in my reviews when I review other people's models that the skin looks too flat. A nice simple glaze of the contrast paint applied uh, can be a pretty good way to go about it, uh, especially if you don't have access to inks and things like that that somebody might normally use for the glaze. So this is a short section, but I just wanted to quickly touch on the fact that there's so much you can explore with these because they have an ink-like property uh, and because of the way that they sort of naturally uh, are transparent, they're going to give people a lot of the benefits that might have been there for those of us using things like FW, FW ink or something like that. But they're a little bit thicker like a paint. And so there are that, you know, it's kind of a, it's a middle step in between. And the nature of how easily they flow, the way they, they mess with surface tension, does provide for some really interesting opportunities for us to play with. Okay, so that's that. One more section to go. 
when we come back, we're going to do airbrushing because of course we are. Uh, these paints do in fact airbrush and they airbrush really awesomely. So back in just a second. All right, our final note on contrast paints and about airbrushing them. Uh, yes, they do airbrush, you can airbrush them. So here we've got our airbrush. And what we're gonna do, let's adjust that light a little bit there. There we go. So I'm gonna mix this fairly thin. That is to say, I put in about five drops of thinner. We're gonna use about two drops of contrast. So here I have some Space Wolves Gray. We'll get out our little pipette. Whoop. Boop. 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 Okay, we'll do three. That's fine. So it's about a two to one ratio-ish with uh, thinner. Thinner-wise, I'm just using Vallejo Airbrush Thinner. It's the same thing I always use, nothing special. So you can see that's about where we're at in there. Let me do a little backflow. And you can see that's how thin it comes out. Right? So we can use that to filter stuff. Like here on the armor where we wanna smooth out this blend. Just add some little tints. But I hear what you're saying. You're saying, Vince, that is so tiny and so light what you're doing, I can barely even see. Are you actually airbrushing right now? Are you lying to me? Has my whole life been a sham? This is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. I understand. I hear you, random internet person. You're right. We need to do something bigger. Okay. So let's do something very visible. The point with I wanted to make with the Space Wolves Gray is you can actually use the lighter, thinner ones uh, to get a nice filter to just sort of really lightly tint stuff. In airbrushing, there's often the concept of a filter where you're not, uh, you're not completely changing the color of something, you're just adding a thin layer of a light filter to it. But sometimes you need to do a little more. So for example, here is the carapace of a Night Titan. Um, this was more or less done exclusively in contrast paints, uh, more or less. Uh, the initial white was obviously laid down with the same ivory you saw. The reds was just some of the flesh terror red plus some of the uh, Fire Slayer's flesh, I believe is what I used for the, the red. And then the blue is the Achillean green, because of course it is. And there's the orange is the, uh, the Griffhound orange around his eyes, and there's some Yaden yellow in there and stuff like that. So. All of this was more or less airbrushed out. And you can see it went on very smooth. Like look at how nice and crisp and smooth that is over the whole surface. Looks great. I really like the finish. It has a nice like slightly satin finish when put out through the airbrush that I actually really appreciate, especially on a vehicle. So then the question becomes, can we do more? Sure. This time we'll go for a little more like a one-to-one. -one. And let's go ahead and get out some of that Achillean green that I like so much. I, I just feel weird calling it green when it's so obviously blue, but if I, but if I call it something different, then I feel like I'm gonna be, that people aren't gonna know what I'm talking about. So let's call it Achillean fake green. Achille ain't green. Ah, there it is. Got it. All right. So we've got some Achillean green, and we've got it down here at a one-to-one -one ratio. Back fill it up. Okay. 
Now we'll do a little test. That See that light gray? That's where the Space Wolves was. That was mixed like two to one. So I very much thinned a weak color. This is the Achillean green. It's, sorry, Achillean green. Much different situation. You can see I already have my banner here, Zenithold. And you'll notice just like an ink, because it's so thin and transparent, what I can do is I can, even in this sort of a thin glaze, I can control how many applications of it I'm doing. Like when I put down one thin layer, I get this really weak coverage that just turns it a very soft blue, right? But if I think in reverse and say, okay, this is gonna be my highlight color, and then I start adding more and more layers, right, and just slowly build in, then what I can get is something that's actually stronger. And more of a true blue. Okay. So the answer to does it airbrush, yes, quite well. It actually, if you're familiar with airbrushing inks, you're going to be very, very familiar with this. The natural transparency, the way they work, the way they flow is very much like you would know from doing, uh, from working with inks through airbrush. So, pretty easy peasy. Again, I don't know that I have any great other insights for you there. It's a great glaze, it's a great filter out of your airbrush. If you can, it's a great way to base coat. It shows the undershade through, so if you've prepared it with something like zenitholing or, you know, like panel modulation in the, cape, in the case of this top of this Imperial Knight, then it's a just, it's an absolutely wonderful product in that regard. Okay, so that's airbrushing it. It's pretty simple, like there's not a lot to it. Um, I find that if I want to use a filter where I want it to just sort of tint, uh, I go at a uh, two to one-ish ratio. If I want to actually get coverage, I go something like one to one or just slightly below. And those have been the good ratios for me. Your mileage may vary slightly, but that's where I've had the most success. Okay, so that brings us to the end of all the different tests we're gonna put this thing through, all these paints through. But I still have some more final thoughts. So I'll be back in just a moment and I'll kind of wrap up my final thoughts. All right, so final thoughts and summaries and summations and wrap ups and whatnot on contrast paints. Uh, by the way, if you skip to the end of the video to see these final thoughts first, hi, welcome. There's lots of stuff to go back and check out. I hope you enjoy it. If you stick with me the whole time and you watched all this and got to hear, glad to hear it. Uh, welcome to the end of the video. I know this was a long one. Uh, so my final thoughts on contrast paints are this. They are expensive for what they are. I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? I mean, these things in the US are, you know, something like eight bucks a pot. There's not a huge amount of paint in here comparatively to what you might get for $8. As you can see, I paid 780 or something. Um, for what you might get for $8 out of something else, uh, you know, you could go out and get a couple other paints or something like that for the same price. That being said, I think they do work as they say on the tin. Uh, did I need these in my life? No. Are they a miracle product or sorcery or something that's going to absolutely change the way you think about paint? Uh, maybe, depending on where you are in your hobby journey. But what I can say is that who cares about any or all of that? None of that matters. The only questions that matter to me are, are they useful? Are they functional? Are they worth it to you? And are you able to achieve results you like with them? And if the answer to those questions are yes, then they're great for you, bottom line, okay? Where they excel is in things like getting down a quick color across everything that retains some contrast. For those of you familiar, as I said at the beginning, with my, with my sort of technique that I've been talking about for a while, or sketch style for Matt DiPietro, or anything like that, the idea of establishing a, a, a zenithal 
a, a, a grise sketch, okay, a, a gray sketch, a black and white gray sketch under the model and then applying, you know, thin colors over top. If you're familiar with that, then, and, and you like that style, these are going to be useful to you. I actually think they work a lot better after testing over these models. Like you can, you know, when I started, I talked about some of these models I glossed, some of them I didn't, some of them I dry brushed, and so on and so forth. And in the end, the final work brought all of them mostly to the same level, regardless of sort of what that individual prep was. The differences are more pronounced if you don't go the rest of the steps up as per this guy who's still back in just, you know, one base coat land. And you can see the difference here between sort of going to a higher level and staying at, you know, step one, right? My feeling is that uh, these are, are a great, great, great tool. If you're someone who wants to play with a painted army but doesn't have a lot of time to paint and or likes working in thin layers and thin glazes, likes using inks and that kind of stuff. These are gonna provide you a wide range of colors with a lot of interesting effects. And they're so naturally thin in the way they work, they can just become a great part of that. I know James Wapple has been using them much like he would use oils to lay down his quick base coat. The difference being that he doesn't have to wait a day and a half for these to dry. Uh, because he, just like you saw me kind of just stabbing with a big brush, you can just kind of get those base colors down and then build on it and build on it and build on it. Which is another nice, uh, ultimately, thing about these is that you could get your army quote-unquote battle ready, but then you could come back over time and work on it if you were so inclined. My general feeling uh, uh, about them, I, I think, is that they have a lot of uses and that you should give them a shot. Uh, if you're on the fence on them or something like that, I mean, this isn't a product review video, but this is just my personal editorializing. Um, I, I think you should give them a shot and see how they would work for any of the things that I've recommended today. See if any of those fit in your own personal style. One small note is that uh, this has brought up a lot of discussion about sort of painting styles and techniques and how you go about building color on the models. And there's been a video I've wanted to do for a long time, so look for that coming soon. We're gonna do a big special video for the 200th, dedicated completely to sort of painting styles and techniques and things like that that I hope will be very useful. So contrast, final thoughts. Uh, it is a good paint, it's not a miracle. But if it makes you put your painted miniatures on the table, then that's miracle enough for me. Uh, remember that the more water, other paint, or other medium you add, the less they will start to stretch back on their own and pull away from the highlights and sink into the recesses. Not necessarily a bad thing, just a thing you need to be aware of. I think they work best when they're working with other things, like if you take all of these and combine it with, say, an ivory and a black, or a deep blue black, or a deep purple, or something like that, whatever you want to use for your deep shadow color. I think that that combination actually works the best um, because that allows you to actually push the contrast all the way, quote unquote, as it were. They work great for techniques like loaded brush and wet blending. Their dry time, the nature of how, and how liquidy they are, means that they really seat into those techniques well. Their high transparency means they're great for things like glazing. Where they're not gonna do well is establishing strong color. Ultimately, when you paint with these, the, you know, you really have to do a lot of work to make the paint not feel somewhat thin and transparent. Like, it is relying on the undershade. So like a sketch style or something like that, it will feel a bit more faded, more washed out in the color. If you really want to up the saturation to super high levels, then you're going to have to either use one of the really strong colors like the Flesh Terrors Red and apply it multiple times over ivory or build it, you know, build it up very carefully, or you're just gonna have to use a different paint. These aren't really made to get hyper intense and saturated, but they will give you the, the contrast. Again, much like using a thin ink or something like that over a Zenithal would do. Uh, you don't need the primers that they have. I'm sure they're perfectly fine. If you already have them, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but any relatively smooth primer, especially out of an airbrush, will certainly work. So there you go. That's the ultimate guide to contrast. 
Uh, I hope I covered everything and every angle there, but I'm sure I didn't. If I missed something, probably something obvious as I was writing down all these bullet points that I wanted to touch on and, and really deep dive into for all of you, uh, please do ask in the comments below. I'm happy to engage in a discussion on this. I hope you all found this very useful. Uh, I wanted to make this something, a resource that people could come back to over time and uh, and sort of as they work with the paint and experiment and, and glean new things about it or change their own style, see how this could, could factor in there. So with that being said, thank you very much for watching. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, give this a like if you liked it. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. We have new hobby cheating here every Saturday. Uh, and of course, as we have other shows as well. Uh, but if you have anything you'd like to see for a future topic, feel free to drop that down in the comments. Always love suggestions from viewers. But as always, I thank you for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.